Hey guys, welcome back. It is a beautiful fall day today. Nate is up by the front working with the tractor to try to fill in some trenches that he had opened up a few months ago to put irrigation up by the road for an orchard and for cows and things. So we're just finishing that off before the weather really takes a uh, turn to get really cold. We don't want any of those pipes breaking. So we're just gonna get that done this weekend and be done with it. And we're really glad that that's all taken care of now for us. Um, I've been shelling beans. That seems to be a very popular activity, um, especially while the kids are, you know, maybe having some downtime or something or anytime that I have some downtime, we're just trying to shell beans because we have so many of them taking up our dining room area. <laughs> So we're trying to get those taken care of. But um, one of the nice things about beans is that, you know, you have them and you can eat them, but you can also save these for next year's seeds so that you don't have to buy them. Um, this year I bought three tiny little packets from Azure Standard of these Jacob cattle beans. And I really love these guys. They're so cute. They look like little cows. So yeah, it's really nice because you can eat them or save them for seed. And now I don't have to buy them next year. I think those three seed packets may have cost me three to four dollars a piece. So 12 bucks, which is kind of expensive for just a few seeds. Um, but now I'll have my own supply. But one of the key things to know when you're saving your seeds is you know, hey, how do I know that this didn't get cross-pollinated? How do I know that this is a pure Jacob's cattle bean? Um, and to know that, you have to do a little research and you need to make sure that you know isolation distances, meaning you can't plant another variety of bean within 10 feet of this variety of bean. And so that varies for all uh, different things that you're growing, flowers, beans, melons, tomatoes, all that kind of stuff. So it takes a little bit of research and a little bit of practice to make sure that you're actually getting a true pure seed. So that leads me into what I really want to talk about today. And that is, I was doing some research on the internet the other day on uh, bioengineered foods and you guys I'm sure have seen that video. But I stumbled across um, someone who was talking about seed saving and they mentioned something like what happens when you can't get your own seeds anymore and I thought okay like that how is that gonna happen you know I'll just either save my seed or there's a lot of companies out there you know that we all look at like you know there's high moaning organic seeds there's Johnny seeds there's Baker Creek you know some of them are more they don't they go more towards those heirloom varieties you know that you can seed safe from so so why would those companies go out of business but anyways i i thought you know I'm, i'll do a little research i'll kind of you know dive into it a little bit and see what i can find and what i found was actually a, a bit terrifying so as i was on the internet um i started looking to see you know, who owns the biggest seed companies? You know, is there any governmental control over that? And what I found out is that in the global seed market, there are four main companies that own the majority of the global seed market. And I think you'll be very surprised to learn who those are, okay? So number one is Bayer, okay? Bayer, you know, have you ever seen the aspirin, Bayer aspirin? <laughs> so Bayer owns a good portion of the global seed market. They bought out Monsanto, I believe, in 2018. And we all know who Monsanto was, right? They're the producers of Roundup. Um, they also make, or they also used to make seeds that were Roundup resistant, you know, so they were genetically modified so that you could just douse that crop in Roundup. And, uh, and still have your crop grow, but not have to fight those weeds. Okay, so like I said, Bayer now owns Monsanto, and they're a huge part of the global seed market. Okay, the next one is a company named Syngenta. Okay, so Syngenta was formed, ooh, I think it was in 2000, okay? So they took, and you're gonna recognize these names, they took uh, Novartis, and AstraZeneca, those sound familiar to you? They took those two companies, merged them together and made Syngenta, okay? So if you don't know who those two companies are, Novartis and um, AstraZeneca, 
those are pharmaceutical companies. They make drugs just like Bayer does, prescription drugs, over-the-counter drugs. Um, now, what's interesting about that is that Syngenta was then bought out uh, in 2020, perhaps. I'm not exactly sure on my dates, but right around that time, they were bought out by ChemChina, which is a Chinese state-owned enterprise, okay? So now you have Bayer and you have Syngenta, okay? Those two players own a huge amount of the global seed market. Okay, then you have another company, which we've all heard of, which is DuPont. Okay, so DuPont, I'm not sure if they specifically manufacture pharmaceuticals, but they have their hand in it. They are making um, either the active ingredients um, or they're supplying these to pharmaceutical companies. They're also making um, chemicals and different things in that industry. Okay, so there's DuPont, okay, Bayer, Syngenta, and DuPont. And it's interesting to note that between Bayer and DuPont, they own 40% of the global seed market. And then the last company is Lima Grain, which I believe is more of a seed and agro, cult, agro company, meaning that they make, you know, they produce seeds and then they also produce uh, chemicals. So just the fact that the majority of our global seed market is controlled by pharmaceutical companies or companies that have their hand in prescription drugs or, you know, those processes and manufacturing things is, is quite, it's, it's really terrifying. You know, um, these companies are making those genetically modified seeds. Now, as a consumer, you and I, we can't get those seeds. These things are made mostly for big farmers and big ag. Um, but what's interesting about that is that the seed companies have, you know, the farmers will buy seed from these seed companies that are genetically modified. Okay, and the seeds are genetically modified to work best with the chemicals that these companies are also manufacturing. Okay, so maybe you need this particular fertilizer. Maybe you need this particular pesticide. Maybe you need this particular herbicide or something to go along with that seed to really get it to produce a crop for you. Because if you're farming it and you're in big ag, your, uh, you know, your paycheck is coming from how much you can produce and then sell at market. So they've also genetically modified these seeds to you know, have a bad germination rate after a certain amount of time. So your farmers, one, can't save their seeds because they're genetically modified, they're not heirloom. And two, if they did save them, chances are they wouldn't germinate anyway and they'd be in infringement of some type of a law. I'm, I'm almost positive about that. So it's, it's just really interesting. But if they wanted to start limiting or regulating or doing something with heirloom seeds or with non-genetically modified seeds, um, you know, could they do that? I think the answer is yes, I think they could do that. And you might say, well, you know, that's okay. I'll just take my time, I'll buy a book, I'll learn how to seed save, um, it'll be fine. But what happens when your crop of corn gets cross-pollinated from next door, you know? And then they come to your door and say, hey, we wanna test your seed because we think you might be growing our genetically modified seeds here. If you guys remember, a while back, years ago, there was a lot of litigation where Monsanto would go to neighboring farms or um, you know farmers who were growing a crop that they were growing, specifically uh, soybeans, I believe it was, and they would test that farmer's crop to see if their soybeans contained any of the genetic material of their genetically modified seeds because their seeds are trademarked, okay? So you cannot grow that seed unless, you know, you have purchased it from Monsanto is, is how I believe it works. Anyway, so they were testing these seeds from these neighboring farms and finding out, hey, this seed has my genetic material in it. You know, you can't grow it anymore. And what was happening was either you had cross-pollination or maybe a bird picked up a seed from this crop, you know, and flew and, you know, dropped it over here or however it happened, okay? But Monsanto was essentially putting these smaller farmers out of business um, because, you know, they were saying that it was, you know, 
it, it was illegal for them to grow these seeds since it had their trademarked genetic material in it. You know, you might say, well, geez, you know, I, I live far enough away, you know, I've got some acreage, I live far enough away where cross-pollination may not be an issue for me. Well, I mean, if you want to take it a little bit further and go a little bit, you know, conspiracy theory here, what if there was a way to put that pollen or whatever was needed, right, to cross-pollinate your crops with their crops? What, what, if, what if there was a way, you know, I mean, perhaps what if a plane flew over and dropped something that, you know, pollinated your plants and, and now you no longer have that pure seed? I mean, we all know that it's best to save heirloom seeds, to grow things that are heirloom, um, because you know that you're guaranteed to get that pure plant. You know you're going to get that same pepper plant every year. When you start growing seeds that have maybe been cross-pollinated or seeds that are hybrid or something like that, you're not necessarily going to get the product um, from that seed that that original pepper gave you. You know, maybe it'll be bitter, maybe it will be smaller, maybe it won't, um, you know, maybe it'll be really, really tough. You just don't know. So over time, you can literally just wipe out varieties and varieties and varieties of pure heirloom seeds. And I think it would be a pretty easy thing to do. I mean, just considering the amount of, gosh, corruption in our world. And if you really want to, you know, control people, right, you control the food. I mean, we've all heard that. Um, you look at the plight of the Native American when uh, they wouldn't sell their land to the U.S. government, and what did we do? We slaughtered buffalo, which essentially brought the Native Americans into submission, right? They were hungry. They had nothing to, nothing to eat, so when they were hungry, the government said, well, sure, we'll give you this food, you know, as long as you sign these papers. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting when you look at that and you look back in history of how things have happened, and I think that we have become so just conditioned to think it can never happen to us. We live in America and we're free, but um, I think we all need to sit back and think about it for a little bit. I think we need to really make sure that we're aware of, of what is going on and what could possibly happen. And so I would encourage you guys to really take the time this winter in the slow season. If you live in a place where you can't grow or your growing season is, is very limited uh, because of the colder weather and the decreased sun, um, to take your time and to learn about seed saving uh, techniques and maybe try to do that next year. I know that I'm going to really limit my tomato varieties next year so that I can save my tomato seeds because this year I grew so many different varieties all right next to one another that I am positive that they cross pollinated. So um, yeah, I know that that's gonna be something on my list to focus on next year. But anyways, guys, just a little food for thought. Um, let me know what you guys think. Uh, let me know if that, I mean, is that surprising to you that over 50% of the global seed market is owned by these companies um, that are pharmaceutical companies that make prescription drugs? It's interesting, right? Prescription drugs and the food supply and, you know, food supply is so directly related to our health and, you know, pharmaceuticals is a huge industry, big, big money in that. It's just, you know, something to think about. Anyways, guys, thank you so much for hanging out with me today. I hope you all have a great rest of your day and leave me some comments below. I'd love to know your thoughts.